Hey everyone, welcome to our May Career Pathway Showcase Series. Um, today we are going to be talking about how to build a quality work-based learning program. My name is Karen Smith. I'm from the Department of Public Instruction on our Career and Technical Education team, and I'm excited to be hosting this session for, uh, for you. Just a reminder that um, we are recording this session. And again, also a reminder to make sure that you're on mute throughout this whole presentation so we don't get any background noise because this is going to be fast and furious. You're going to want to catch every word. So I brought together an amazing panel of speakers um, that are here today to share with you their many pearls of wisdom about building quality work-based learning programs. We've got Jeremy Jakes, who is the Director of Partner Services at GPS Education Partners. We've got Chuck Keller, the Career and Life Ready Program Director at CESA 3. We've got Tom Herman, the Consortium and Youth Apprenticeship Coordinator at Southwest Milwaukee Consortium. And we have Aaron Williams, the Coordinator of Career and Technical Education at Kenosha Unified School District. So thank you all for joining us today um, and being willing to share some of your experience and expertise with everyone who's in the room with us, just waiting to hear what you have to say about quality work-based learning. All right, we're going to dive right into it. We've got a series of questions and every question I've asked um, one of our speakers to respond to and I gave them the challenge of responding in just two minutes because we've got a lot of ground to cover today. So let's start with the big picture question. We know that it's important for work based learning to really be embedded into all of our other career readiness initiatives. So how does your work based learning program connect to other career readiness initiatives like academic and career planning, career and technical education and our career pathways? Well, thank you, Karen. Um, it, it's really important to um, have a common vision. And when you're working and coordinating all of these different teams, and one of the things we use is the CLNA pro uh, process to, to identify what our needs are and then to set common goals. And then your budgets really have to align with those goals to ensure that the, the money that you're spending is spent on, on the, the right types of things. And the team we, we have is each one of us has a uh, an area that we concentrate on, but then we have overlapping spheres of influence so that we could coordinate our goals and we can work together. And then we can share resources to make sure everybody's working together to ensure the, the highest quality program that we can provide. Yeah, Chuck, and that's one of the things I really appreciate about CISA 3. You know, you've got your CISA ACP coordinator, your CT coordinator, your regional career pathway coordinator, all working together. So it's much easier to connect all those, those different things to, to youth apprenticeship and work-based learning, you know, when you have all those people that are already meeting together on a regular basis. So thank you. All right, our next question, let's talk about program design. Um, briefly describe your work-based learning program design in terms of school-based activities, work-based activities, and connecting activities. I think that's mine. Uh, thank you, Karen, and thanks for having me uh, with you this morning. I'm Jeremy Jakes with GPS Education Partners. Uh, we're a 22-year-old nonprofit organization that specializes in this topic of work-based learning. So uh, one of the things that we've learned over a couple decades in um, designing and executing work-based learning programs is that it's really a journey for students that can start as early as late middle school and early high school with um, more what we would call softer touch activities. And I'm sure many of you are already doing this, um, but typically those are more heavier on the school side um, of the programming and more school-based. And then as a student progresses through their journey, the school-based component becomes smaller and smaller and the work-based component becomes larger and larger. So um, for most of our history, we've specialized in kind of that middle um, section, the career experience sweet spot of 11th and 12th graders. Um, we run a statewide youth apprenticeship consortium, primarily focusing on manufacturing um, that uses youth apprenticeship as a component of the program. It's, it's not the whole program, um, but it is the, the grounding point for all of our work-based learning experiences. So as a student progresses through the journey, they get deeper and deeper into um, their work-based experiences um, through youth apprenticeship. And then particularly in the last few years, we've really got 
more and more of our students and more and more of our business partners. Um, we partner with around 100 manufacturing business partners and construction around the state and then around 50 school districts to um, engage in registered apprenticeship or um, bridging from youth apprenticeship to registered apprenticeship, which I'm sure many of you are doing, but that's just been a really great off-ramp for our students to be able to um, transition from a high school student into an adult um, registered apprenticeship. And then the other thing that we do a, a lot of um, is convene. So we bring together businesses, schools, and community leaders. Um, in fact, I'm actually at a, an event venue that we're gonna be holding a fundraising event in June um, right now. So um, the mural over my left shoulder is actually a mural of Betty White. Um, it's a Moss mural. So this is a cool event that we're gonna be hosting downtown Milwaukee at the Direct Supply Innovation Center. So we do a lot of those sorts of things to get together businesses, schools, and community leaders and students that are all working to try to get more young people into the world of work. Oh, that's awesome, Jeremy. I really appreciate that, you know, kind of chunking out those three different areas to think about, you know, your school activities, your work activities, and then how, how do you make those connections? That was perfect. And this is a great graphic as well. All right, so now we're gonna dive in a little bit deeper to program coordination. Our next question is who coordinates your work-based learning program? And then tell us a little bit about what that role looks like and what are the skills that a really good work-based learning coordinator absolutely needs? Well, that's me again. And so at the, at the CISA level, um, I'm one of the coordinators and and I, I lead the youth apprenticeship and the work-based learning. Um, what does that role look like? Well, we, uh, we serve 39 schools in Southwest Wisconsin. And within each one of our schools, there's a, uh, there's a person who's responsible for that. They could be a school to work coordinator. They could be a, a CTE professional educator. They could be a school counselor. They could be an, a, a in administration, it all depends. But somebody who has uh, the responsibility locally. And so what does that skill need to be inside of the school? Well, we're looking for somebody that has a strong business sense that can help make contacts with the local business person. So they have to be able to speak the language. Uh, it really helps if a person has a strong marketing sense so that they can market to the students, market to the parents, market to their administrators, and then again, the local businesses. Someone who has very strong organizational skills and process management skills, many work-based learning programs, especially this time of year, we're, we're closing out one group, but then we're recruiting for the next year and there's some overlap. So those, those are skills that people really need to be able to have is manage, what year am I in? And then finally, they need to be able to break down barriers because there's always a barrier, there's always a reason why it can't work, but who's gonna break down those barriers and help those, uh, those students uh, have an opportunity to shine? And it, those barriers can be with the businesses. It could be uh, age barriers. It could be scheduling barriers within the school district. It could be policy barriers. There's all sorts of barriers and that person really needs to be a strong advocate for the students and be able to fight in some cases for the opportunity to, to provide a quality work-based learning program. Damn, great list. Oh, sounds like someone is off mute. <laughs> uh, so if everyone could quick check, make sure that you're muted. There we go. All right, we're back on track. Uh, Chuck, thank you. That was that was a, a great answer. Um, you know, and we were just talking um, as we were getting ready for this this webinar about how you know we've got a couple of folks with us that represent consortiums, but when you think about our larger school districts and even some of our our medium sized school districts, when they are operating work based learning, it almost feels like an actual consortium. You know, so that idea of having one primary work based learning coordinator, but then you know individual people at separate buildings that have some responsibility is, um, is not lost on many school districts. I'm sure that resonates with a lot of people here. And regardless of a, if you're a small school, medium school or large school, really understanding that role and those skills are really critical to making sure that you got the right person in the place um, to do that. And that person is always brushing up on their skills. So thank you. 
So you talked about marketing to students. So let's dive into to recruiting students. Would love to hear what are your best, most innovative strategies to recruit students and how do you help them get ready for success in the program? Thank you, Karen. Um, I think one of the things that we do down here at Kenosha Unified is we started small. We started with a small group of students that really were in our capstone CTE courses that aligned well with the pathways that we had employers looking for, and we started with them. Um, and the, the biggest component, and it's going to kind of follow up with the next question too, is let the students sell the program, celebrate their successes, and, and they're the best recruiter. It took me a a couple meetings to, to finally realize that, but the students sell the program to their peers. Um, so celebrate those successes and have those conversations. We invite our students to our uh, youth apprenticeship nights where they're on a panel to discuss their, uh, their successes and challenges that they had. So let them promote it. Um, the other thing that we've done is make the connection with other work-based learning programs. There's a lot of opportunities out there. It's not just one set program. Um, but make those connections because there is some overlap, find what works best for you. And then showing kids what we've really started to get into now is how that progression from sixth, seventh, eighth grade leads into high school and leads into um, the work-based learning at, at the higher level. So showing the kids that because sometimes they don't know and it's educating the students and the parents along that piece. Uh, getting our kids ready for, for it, uh, our, our school-based coordinators do a lot of resume work uh, with our students. We've incorporated resume writing in many of our CTE courses. Um, we do mock interviews. Uh, we have mock interviews even at the middle school level, so it starts pretty young. Um, and then one thing that each of our high schools has um, is clothing closets. So getting those kids prepared uh, if they don't have the means to dress for success um, and need something, if they need a tie, if they need a button up shirt or a skirt or dress to get themselves ready, um, each of our schools typically have that ability to get students ready in that way. And then just taking tours, getting the kids out into our employers to see what's in their backyard. Those are amazing strategies. Do you want to repeat them all? No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> I will on the next one because they're kind of the same. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, no, that's all really, really good stuff. And, you know, some of the things that, that, I mean, it's all good, but some of the things that really jumped out to me is that idea of a student ambassador, um, as well as that importance of that continuum of career-based learning experiences. And Jeremy talked a little bit about that too, right? You don't want to just plop a student right into a work-based learning experience without having some of those previous career-based learning experiences. On the other hand, you could also use those previous career-based learning experiences, job shadows, career fairs, you name it, company tours, to help promote your work-based learning program. So it kind of works both ways. Love it. All right, so we're gonna keep going with strategies. Now we're turning the um, turning towards employers. So what are your best, most innovative strategies to recruit employers? And then how do you onboard them? So this is kind of similar. We started small. We had a small core of employers that really had some great successes and, and kind of spread the word for us. So it goes back to that celebrate successes and let the employer sell the program. Uh, to other employers. We have one person that's on our steering committee that is offered to host mentor training at their business to kind of draw the attention to this is how youth apprenticeship works and this is how it's benefited their company and what you may be able to replicate with yours. So it's really been a community effort. Um, we have a great relationship with our business alliances. Um, they've done active recruitment for us. A lot of times if a new employer comes to town, um, we're invited to that that initial kind of conversation saying this is what we have to offer for work-based learning and other opportunities within our district. So, um, but selling the, the program, letting the employer sell it has been that main piece also. Um, one of the other things that we've, we've adapted to and has helped us really bit is just blend the education and the employer schedule. Um, we've realized that a lot of times our business partners don't have the same schedule as us in education. So just being able to schedule things early in the morning, if it's a evaluation or just a quick conversation, it's kind of around that lunchtime or later in the day. So it's not very, we can't just stay on that rigid schedule. We have to be accommodating to them um, also. And then onboarding, 
Uh, we used some recorded mentor trainings uh, this year because we were we were locked down for our uh, pandemic protocols. So we did that. Um, that went out to all of our mentors uh, throughout uh, the year. And then we will do it also in person and then potentially at an employer um, to bring people in to see what it's about. So um, a lot of conversations, a lot of meetings and just let it sell and, and continue on. That's amazing. You know, I love that idea of recorded mentor training because that's such an important component of work-based learning on both sides. We often hear from employers like, I don't really know how to work with high school students, you know, and, and so we want to make sure that as we send our kids in for these experiences, they're going to be working with someone um, that, that is going to give them a good experience. So I think it's, you know, it's important to the student. It's also important to them at the employer and doing that in a recorded, you know, recording them just makes it easier to ensure that all your employers get that really important training, you know, and can even refer back to it if they need a refresher. Now, Erin, the other thing that you said that that I really like and I'm sure, you know, makes a lot of people breathe a little sigh of relief is that idea about starting small, whether it comes to, you know, recruiting students or employers, you know, don't feel like you have to start a program, you know, with 25, 30 students, you know, start, start small and then just grow from there and let your students and your employers speak for your program. Great advice. All right, so now let's move on and talk about equity, diversity, and inclusion. So we'd love to hear what you're doing to increase diversity in your work-based learning programs, specifically what strategies help work-based learning programs to be more inclusive so that we can see students from um, other populations participating at higher rates. Sure, that's mine. I'm Tom Herman. I'm in the uh, Milwaukee area. I work at Whitnell, Greendale, Greenfield, St. Francis and Franklin High Schools. Uh, in order to up our diversity game, uh, we really got to actors. Uh, there are people within the district that know exactly the subpopulations that you're trying to reach. So um, I reached out to the at-risk teacher, the special ed teachers, the ELL teachers, obviously our counselors, social workers, school psych, even assistant principals, they know the population that you're trying to reach. They know exactly specifically who you're trying to connect with. Um, beyond that, you know, I get into their classrooms. I go to club meetings. It could be Skills USA, it could be HOSA, it could be DECA. Um, hang out in the cafeteria. I'm wearing my YA shirt. You know, if you just wander around the cafeteria, people ask, like, who is that person? Um, We've actually held a community conversation and that was where our special ed families and students um, were invited to a meeting with employers that were open to hiring our special populations and just having a conversation about, well, how do we get over hurdles and what hurdles exist? And, you know, let's make it work. You know, we're all good, at, you know, we're, we're all good at making things happen and figuring out solutions. So let's just get in a room and figure it out. Um, Ultimately, it's going to the students. Um, you have to make yourself available. You have to go to them. These are not the population of kids. Well, I shouldn't say this. Most kids don't listen to the announcements anyways, okay? And they don't read the little flyers on the walls, you know? Uh, so you gotta be more intentional, okay? And a specific example of that, we just had a huge trades and hiring event. I made business cards uh, and I handed it out to all the teachers and people that I just mentioned, I said, Hand these out and then personally invite like three to five kids to this event, okay? They will respond to you because I'm Mr. Herman. I, I'm like three or four layers away from them. They trust you. You're their teacher. You're their at-risk, you know, guidance counselor or whatever. Um, and it's, you know, here it is. Here, here's exactly what this information is. Send a little, you know, a little business card kind of thing. Um, I actually made a video. Uh, we had three employers talk about the value that special ed students were to their workplace culture and how they thought this was a big, you know, oh my God, this is gonna be so many hurdles and all these different things we have to get over. And it isn't, okay? And, and the value that these special ed students brought to their culture was amazing. And I chopped it down. It was a webinar. It's an hour long. I chopped it down. I'm, you know, I'm not a production, you know, video production guy. I'm an English teacher, actually by trade. You know, I had my son teach me how to do iMovie so I could chop it down to 10 minutes. 
Now I have a 10 minute video to hand out to um, other prospective employers that may be open to working with our special ed population. And again, it's not me talking, it's three other employers that are already doing this. You know, these testimonies are invaluable, you know, um, and they're also willing to take phone calls from these other prospective employers, um, which again, you know, uh, I, I think, I think Chuck uh, mentioned it, you know, there's only so many things that you can do. There's only so much bandwidth that, you know, each one of us has. So, you know, reach out and connect with other people that are willing to say, yeah, sure. I'll take a phone call or an email from somebody else. I'll tell them what we've done. If anything, they're celebrating the success that happened in their building. I'm sorry, in their industry or in their company. So um, that's one way, I guess, to really reach a diverse populations. Um, our second question is, who do you partner with to make all this work? And what's your best advice about partnership building? Um, connect with every social agency that has anything to do with kids. Um, we connect with our local chambers. Obviously, they're invested in our schools and our kids. Our Bo uh, Boys and Girls Club, um, they have a program called Brighter Futures, which actually brings counselors into our student, our counselors into our high schools. And they work uh, kind of with a lot of ACP type activities. Um, Goodwill, um, this is something I learned this year. Goodwill does, you know, resume training for us. And all we have to do is get the kids, in, you know, online at a certain time and, and they take care of everything. Um, Rodscope is actually a company that's right here in Greenfield. Um, you know, it's one thing to say to like a special ed family, um, or even case managers like, hey, go out and reach out to DVR. And, you know, well, that's great. Okay. And, and DVR is great, but there's a lot to navigate with that for that kid and that family to go from being in high school to actually being in DVR in order to get their services. Uh, Broadscope is a company that actually does that. Um, they act families navigate that whole DVR process. Phenomenal. Okay, that, that's a force multiplier that we don't have to have now, you know. Um, taking, I also said taking a regional approach, approach with employers. Um, I work with Aaron. I, I, I work with Jeremy. I work with Chris Daniels down at uh, South, uh, South Suburban. I work with the people in uh, Muskego. James Mitchleg is there. You know, all these employers don't want all of us to bug them. You know, um, so if, you, if there's any way you can share employers, I think that that is the way to go. Um, if I have a student that we don't have an employer for, I'll reach out to these people and vice versa. If I have a company that's like, we work with this company and I don't have a student, you know, I, I don't want that company to go a year without having a student, you know. Um, I, quite honestly, I, I'm kind of at the point where I don't really care whose student takes that spot, but we don't want to lose that spot. Okay. So, you know, go reach out to these other people that are doing this job and, you know, um, it's called collaboration, but really what it is, it's stealing from everybody else. Okay. Uh, in education, it's called collaboration. It's a much softer thing, but you know, everyone's doing the same job. So just steal from other people, you know, um, I guess last thing I would say is, um, really try to, uh, I think Aaron just mentioned to it, get your employers to get other employers. You know, we're in the education field. One employer talking to another employer saying, hey, this is a value to you to have these students working and here's how it's working in our company. Those testimonies are absolute gold. Um, this Saturday, I'm actually going to be on the radio on 1250, the, the FAM, uh, the, I'm sorry, the FM, whatever, whatever it's called. Um, with uh, Bingo Emmons from the Nary. Uh, and basically he's going to say, hey, we've had these kids. These are great, you know. Um, that's, that's invaluable. You know, for an hour we're going to talk on the radio and he's going to say, you know, I've had these kids. And, you know, I, everyone knows Bingo Emmons in the in Milwaukee area if you do anything with remodeling. So, you know, leveraging those types of, uh, you know, connections, that's, that's how you build up your partnerships. Todd, that's great. It's it's all about working smarter, not harder. 
you know, and I hope what everyone in this webinar is hearing very loudly and clearly is whether you are a, you know, lone person in a small district, a medium district, a large district that acts as a consortium in a way or, or actual consortium for your work based learning program. You have to, you know, develop that network, develop those partnerships, build your ambassadors, and that's how you grow a really quality work based learning program. So as we start to get um, towards the end of this, I would love to hear a little bit about the future of work-based learning. Are there any new trends in work-based learning programs or what's on the horizon for the future of work-based learning? All right, I think that's mine. Um, first, I'm definitely gonna tune in, Tom, and listen to you on the radio. You have a great radio voice, so looking forward to that. <laughs> um, so we, we're blessed to have been doing this for, like I said, over 20 years. and. Uh, Wisconsin is really, really fortunate to have the oldest adult apprenticeship system in the country started in 1911 and the oldest youth apprenticeship system and uh, started in 1991. And we came onto the scene in like the very early 2000s. Um, and we've been, Wisconsin's been our home and that's where still our largest programming is. And the program uh, that I oversee is, is our Wisconsin program. But we're really fortunate in the last five years in particular too, to, to expand outside the state. Um, so we now have programming in six states uh, throughout the Midwest and um, some in California as well. And one of the things that we've been able to do is get connected with some of these national organizations. And I just put some on the screen here and just have learned a ton about work-based learning. So if you aren't already connected to their um, listservs and emails and things like that, all of them are great and have great ideas. Um, but I will say one of the things that we've learned as we've kind of um, started to serve other states outside of Wisconsin is that Wisconsin really is ahead of the curve in work-based learning in a lot of ways. And many of these other states are just starting to scratch the surface. So that's been just really kind of pleasing to us to hear that our home state is kind of so far ahead and we've been able to help kind of teach others a little bit in other areas around um, what good work-based learning looks like. But all of these are great organizations. I would say trend-wise, there's more and more support at both the state and the federal level for work-based learning. There's more dollars and grants. And um, it's almost like one of the remaining bipartisan efforts that's out, th out there still. It's, you know, workforce development is relatively kind of neutral, I guess, and people on both sides of the aisle are pretty supportive of it. So that's a good thing. So um, I think the future is bright for work-based learning, both here in Wisconsin and, and beyond the state and looking forward to seeing what's to come. Jeremy, I couldn't agree with you more. The future is bright for work-based learning and career readiness. Uh, all right, so as we as we close up here, um, we're last words of wisdom. So I'm going to ask each of you to, to answer this question really quickly. So what is the most important thing for a new work-based learning coordinator to know when just starting a program? And I'm not sure who wants to go first with this one. Any Any volunteers? All right, Chuck, go ahead. Sure. Uh, the, the first thing you probably want to do is identify why you're starting the program and what is the goal. As many have said, uh, go ahead and start small. You know, maybe focus on a pathway that you're that you're really comfortable with and you're good at and expand from there. And then find out who your partners are. Don't forget about your regional economic development partners and all the other service organizations out there that can want to help you and will help you. Great, wonderful advice. Who would like to go next? Uh, I, I guess I would like to say that, uh, kind of like Chuck said, you know, ask your decision makers exactly what they want. Um, and that may involve you actually trying to help them specify what they want um, in, instead of just being very generic and very general and, and get it down to something that's manageable. And then uh, like in my little shtick um, was reach out to all these other people and say, this is exactly what we're driving at. Okay, this is exactly the population that we're looking for. This is exactly what we're trying to get out of this program. Um, and, and the more clarity you can have and the more specificity you can have, I think it's uh, the better for you. The second thing is, is to reach out to all of us and anybody else in your area. Um, why not just learn um, rather than try to you know, figure it out yourself? Yeah, don't recreate the wheel. We've already got one. <laughs> Aaron, I think you were going to jump in there. You want to go next? Yeah, I, I think my my tip of advice is understand the limitations and potentials for each different type of work-based learning. They all have positives and some some downfalls of them. So understand what 
uh, what your students are looking for and what your community and your school can can support. I mean, that's the biggest piece that all has their ups and downs. So just knowing that. Awesome. Jeremy, ready to round us out here? Sure, I'll, I'll keep it quick. I'd say just just dive in. Sometimes, you know, it's, it's good to just kind of get right at it. We had a new staff member start this week and I was able to have him come to Greenfield High School today, one of Tom's schools and do a presentation. And he wasn't sure what to expect, but just got in there and, you know, start to talk about work-based learning with kids. That's the most fun part and to see them get excited about it. And you'll learn along the way as, as you go. Well, as we start to close, I, I just want to give a huge thank you to Chuck, Aaron, Jeremy, and Tom for sharing all that amazing information with us. Um, I, you know, it was great to see some of those themes come through. And I think if you, whether you're a new work-based learning um, coordinator or an experienced one, hopefully you, you walked away with something. So as we um, you know, this is just our screen. We won't go through it because we're at time, but you know, we, we have new reporting criteria for work-based learning. So if you didn't know about this, you want to get to know about it because it opens the doors for us to be a little bit more innovative about how we offer different types of work-based learning in Wisconsin. Um, also to here to support you is the Wisconsin Guide to Implementing Career-Based Learning Experiences, which you can find on our website that gives you a wealth of information about all the, the entire continuum of career-based learning experiences, but also some really great information specific to work-based learning. We've got one more Career Pathway Showcase series coming up in June. On June 14th, we're going to hear about supervised agricultural experiences. So make sure you stay tuned for that. And we've got our dates for next year. So we are coming back for a second year of the Career Pathway Showcase series. We're going to continue to really shine a light on work-based learning in Wisconsin. And so feel free to mark your calendars um, for these dates on your calendar and, or these dates that you see on the screen. Um, and you'll get a, a there'll be a copy of the slide deck on our web page so you'll be able to go in and catch them if you're not writing them down right at the second. So thank you guys for staying here. We ran out of time for questions. I'll stay on if some of our guest speakers can stay on for a few extra minutes. If someone does have a question, we'd be happy to try to address them for you. And then as always, make sure you stay informed by staying on our, joining our listservs if you're not already on our listservs, because that is your best way to find out about sessions like we had today. So thanks again, you guys. Have a great day and we will see you on June 14th.